thank you. Um, uh, my name is Paul Rogers. I'm an independent software developer. The work that I'm doing today, I do under a, a moniker of uh, Noxon. Uh, I tend to, I tend to be Dingo Sky on on uh, all the social networking, etc. Types of stuff. But uh, this is actually under a moniker of Noxon. And what I'm going to show today is an idea that it's a scenario that I think we're going to see more of. We've already seen some, and we've seen some, some few nightmares from it. But the idea is simple. I've got an iPad, and I've got an uh, I've got a uh, RPi three running nerves, and I want this iPad to run the I, for run this RPi three, and the RPi three is actually running a, a stoplight. Okay, fairly simple idea. You could imagine this is something I bought commercially off the shelf. And I, I sold that to somebody, and then I sold them an iOS app that they can run this thing. It's a therm thermostat, it's a refrigerator, it's whatever, whatever the IoT world is, is dreaming up. You can sort of envision that that's what's sitting here. And what I want to do is talk about you know, how, how do I do this in a way that, that uh, puts some security to it. So the first thing I'm going to do is just get it running, right? So we don't worry about security first, maybe. So I'm going to do this. Um, uh, it, the, the things I've got set up here are uh, Raspberry Pi 3 with a stoplight on it, a momentary switch, I'll explain what those are for, a little network sitting here so that I don't run into the problem man I had, uh, that, that these guys can talk to each other on a close, their own little closed network, this, uh, this Hutu, and then the iPad. I'm, only, I, I, I'm really concentrating on connecting to this one at a time, uh, and I'll explain that as we go along. Here's a system overview. Right, as I just mo mo mentioned there, stoplight, momentary switch. I'm using, running on this uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm not, this is not necessarily a nerves talk. I'm using nerves, obviously. I am indebted to those people who put so much work and fine work in it. It's great. It's actually an interesting little thing to do. I'm running an HTTP interface on that using a, a web server called Ellie. Um, I've got a version of this running with uh, Plug, which uses Cowboy, but this particular one I'd used Ellie. I'd been using Ellie for a number of years and was already comfortable and familiar with it, so I used Ellie. The iPad app is pretty simple. It's just going to show three three lights, and I can poke on them and make these lights change on on my on my RPi. The interaction is 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 as follows. I bought this thing, I brought it home, I downloaded this iOS app, and now I want to make these things be able to talk to each other securely. So I'm going to place this RPi3 into pairing mode. I'm going to pair it with this iPad. Then I can log in using this iPad, and I can use this iPad to control it. And the idea, again, the, the, the thing I'm really after here is saying that only this iPad can run that, that Raspberry Pi. So here's the app that's sitting on. Uh, on this uh, RPi3, a Nerves app. You can see it's got uh, uh, the device pairing is, right now you can see the lights flashing red. This light, that means that nobody can connect to this at all. I have to put it into pairing mode. So I've got a uh, gen server running that's, that's taking care of the device pairing. I've got a stoplight, and that's actually listening to pin 17. So it's looking for voltage uh, increase and decrease on pin 17 using uh, Elixir Ales for uh, general purpose I.O. On the, on the Raspberry Pi. Then I've got uh, another server running the light itself. So it's listening to pins 9, 10, and 11 so that I can go and say, you know, turn pin 9 on, turn pin 10 on, et cetera, and lights will magically appear. The login manager is just the thing that allows these things to all connect to this Hulu and for this guy to then find them. Okay. Uh, Part, I'm part, excuse me, that's actually the network. The login manager is going to be the thing that where, I'm do, where I, I, I actually log in to this so that I, after I've paired, then this guy's got to log into it. And then finally, we see Ellie, and it's got three listeners, more than I need here. Right? I need one, but it's fired up three. And there's the configuration for Ellie. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's like any other web development stack type thing. It's got a stack, and in this case, um, the, so, so these are just all the handlers for it. The status handler checks the device pairing. The login handler says, is somebody logged in? How do I handle that? And then finally, if both of those have passed, then I can actually control the lights. 
So let's do that. First thing I'm first thing I do is if I try to log into this thing, it tells me you can't. That the red light's flashing, it's telling me here that the device is blocked. So all right, so I'm gonna put it in, I'll put it into pairing mode. Hold that momentary switch for a couple of seconds. Fires off a timer, so I've got 20 seconds to get this in, 20 or 30, I don't remember what I made it. And this now I'm pairing, I'm going to give this thing a name. So call it HTTP, whose password will be secret. And by that I mean the word secret, not that you don't get to know it. And then I, I didn't get there fast enough. there now I see that it's flashing green that means now I can control the light I can turn it red I can turn it green turn it yellow turn it red again and the first time you do a nerves app you you go get a beer now right you might even go get two because <laughs> it seems like a real big deal but uh, and 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 mind you also let me just uh, put a quick aside for those of you who have done talks and worry about the demo gods I just I just uh, Andy doubled up here I've got three of these damn things and an iPad and this and <laughs> like just crossing my fingers and we'll see. All right, so let's look at, whoops. That all was well and good. I talked to this thing, but there's a significant problem and that is that anybody on the device, I mean on the network with me could see what I was doing. Here is my pairing where I said I used HTTP in secret, right? There, then I logged in, then I changed the status, I looked, asked what's the status of the light, I turned the light on, I turned it yellow, green, red, etc. Clearly not secure. <laughs> Clearly anybody that can get onto this, uh, hack onto this Hulu 2 could actually be able to see this traffic. But it's actually worse than that. This is just in case my, it didn't work. The, that's, that's what we just saw. But it's a little worse than that in that I'm going to do this again. Let's go. Whoops. I'm going to go here. You can see my light is currently red. Okay. I'm going to go over to this. Uh, yep. Nope. And I'm going to say take the HTTP light and switch it to green. Great. Look at my iPad. Ouch. This turned green, the iPad doesn't know anything about it. Okay. It can even be a little worse than that in that the I can tell the the light to turn red now, and I've got red and green both on. I can't do that with the iPad. It's a, it's a basically a, a a bug. But I didn't catch it on my iPad because I can't I won't allow myself to send that message. So not only can someone control the light, they can put it in an inconsistent state. Clearly not what I thought I was getting into when I said I wanted to control these things, but that's fine. We didn't use any security yet. So the problem here then is that Eve can snoop the traffic, see the plain text, username and password, capture application data. Now I'm going to differentiate here. This is a security talk. I'm going to differentiate between Eve, which I think of as an evil person but just listens, and Mallory, who has malicious intent. They're really the same person, but Mallory's got malicious intent. She'll actually alter the traffic. It's very possible to sit in here between these two, and when this, every time this sends red, to change the traffic and say, make it green instead. And so now this, the, the person trying to control the light here can't get it to even work. Okay? That just give, gives you the, the sense that Mallory now can manipulate this API for fun and profit. And then the, the last the thing that I've really made an issue here is that now someone other than this iPad is controlling that thing. The iPad can still, you know, can still manage it. But without the iPad's knowledge, this, thing's, this, this thing can be changed, and that's not what we wanted. So what do we want to do? We want to add security. I'm, the only, I'm not covering these for secrecy. I'm just trying to be sure nobody's epileptic and decides to collapse, and then I'll feel really bad. Uh, we're going to encrypt this by using symmetric key encryption. This absolute way, well, we'll talk more about it. So that brings up the problem, though, is how do we get 
a symmetric key both on the iPad and on the Raspberry Pi. This is known as the key distribution problem. It's a thorny issue. It has not been solved. I don't care what you think. It's just been addressed, certainly not solved. One of the first things you could try and think of is say, well, just burn the key into both of these. That's basically what uh, the, cipher, uh, the ciphers were for thousands of years. That's what, if you look in, if you read cipher book in history, the first ones you'll talk about are Caesar ciphers and say they rotate the three. Well, that's the pre-shared key is rotating three and you told all your generals, right? Well, the problem with that is that it's got several significant issues. One is called forward secrecy. It's actually called perfect forward secrecy. I took perfect out in my third mat because uh, it, it's perfect in the sense that it's, it's complete, uh, not, not in the sense that nothing could possibly be better. So I, I take it out. I just call it forward secrecy. Key refresh and maintenance are also issues. How do, I get the gen how do I tell the generals that I've changed? How do I make sure that all the generals got all of my changes? So just forget pre-shared key. Just don't try it. So instead, we'll use dynamic key establishment. And the, the scheme that we're going to look at is a, an asymmetric scheme to create our symmetric key, and then we use that symmetric key for the actual secrecy. You've all done this. Whether you knew it or not, that's exactly what HTTPS is. Right? HTTPS is an asymmetric cryptography to establish a key, and then after the fact, everything, that, everything after all the bulk is actually done uh, using symmetric key encryption. So. Now we're going to do this again. This time we're going to connect to the HTTP. And I've already registered this guy. So I can just log in as. And I can't see that, so I hope I'm getting there right. Please. Yep. So now I'm logged in, and I control this guy, this light, and I'm doing that through HTTPS. Just to prove that everything's wonderful in the world, Whoops. We go back over to the, the, oh, by the way, I should have uh, introduced this. Th this is just a man in the middle proxy. Uh, I'm using Charles here. You can, they're free, this one costs $50, but it's so convenient for me. I've had it so long, I like it. Uh, man in the middle proxy is free. Wireshark is free. Uh, web, uh, Windows has other versions, et cetera. So, but here's the key is that after I do that, there's what the traffic looks like. I go, I have another beer. Right? Everything's great. I'm going to restart this and come back tomorrow. And I, you know, I, you know, I sobered up. I came back. I thought, okay, how's this working now? And pardon me while I don't watch the man behind the curtain as, whoops, cancel you, as I go and make a little switch here. And I'm going to do that same thing again. You know. Cancel. So now I'm logging into the HTTP interface. Comes up, so I say HTTPS. I hope that didn't secret. Go on. Right? And Again, I've sobered up. I've looked at this. I've, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about things. I'm running my light. And then somebody notices and says, hey, I'm, I'm running a man in the middle on you. And this is what I see. You log, this is what you logged in with. Here you are switching the light around. Likewise, I can, what color am I on? I'm on red, so I'll switch to green. Come on. It's a little slow, but because it's got to do its, right? And I see that switch to green. This guy doesn't know about it. Basically, I'm right back where I started, almost. I'm a little bit better off, but HTTPS didn't solve my problem. It did not finish it off for me. I thought I was done. I thought all I had to do was use HTTPS, and I would be, I'd be done here. And then clearly, I'm not. So what happened? That's the HTTPS scenario. This is the HTTPS scenario with man in the middle. And I can actually use curl to run this thing. And note that curl, the magic there is that that 
tack K there. That says disregard um, any, uh, any uh, key exchange stuff. I'll see you in a moment about that. But anyway, if you, if you actually man curl, then you can find out that there's that tack K there and do this. So what are the issues? We sort of took care of Eve. She can't see anything, but we didn't take care of Mallory. Now Mallory can still snoop this iPad traffic through legitimate use. Okay? Mallory can manipulate the API for fun and profit. She can control the st stoplight independently of the iPad. And we really now still have this whole man in the middle thing. And, and there, are there, there are companies that, that do man in the middle on all traffic inside of their, that goes out of their, uh, off their network. So it's not like man in the middle can't happen. With man in the middle, I can see plain text user IDs, passwords, capture application data, alter the traffic, et cetera. So at this point, it's time to stop and say, how'd I get here? You know, why didn't that work? What, 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 was my, what was my susceptibility? And I'm going to do that by actually looking back at, a little, at, at, at you know, how we get to HTTPS. And we start in 1976 with Diffie and Hellman. And this is called a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's a way to say it actually revolutionized cryptography. We would not have the current web as we know it without this paper and, and then what followed up a couple of years later, which will be the next slide. Diffie-Hellman found out, or, uh, and, and Merkel actually, this should actually be called DHM. Merkel was involved, but he didn't get, he wasn't on the paper, so history left him behind in this sense. Although we still have him, he still gets Merkel trees, right? So don't feel too sorry for the guy. I actually went to grad school and had a friend who, uh, who he, he pined so hard to have a constant named after him. He just, or, some, or some process, you know, like a Rossby wave. He just, he just he couldn't stand the fact that he didn't know how he was going to achieve that in his life. Uh, me, I'm, I'm all right here. So how does Diffie Elman work? Chuck and Sarah, uh, usually you see this as Alan and Bob. I'm doing, because I'm really concentrating on a, on a client server, I chose another often use Chuck and Sarah, because Chuck's the client and Sarah's the server. What they do is they agree to use two parameters. I'm picking very small numbers on purpose, G2 and 13, and they do the following. Chuck says, I'm going to grab a random number out of the sky, 5. It's got to be less than 13, but we'll try. I'm going to take that 5, 2 to the fifth power, mod it by 13, I get 6. I'll send that to Sarah. Sarah does the same thing. She picked eight. She takes two to the eighth mod 13, gets nine, throws it back to Chuck. Why? Why do they do this? Great. You can do some math. Big deal. Because of the following. Now Chuck takes that six or nine that he got from Sarah, and he raises it to his five that only he knows, mods that with 13, and gets three. Sarah does the same thing. She takes the six she got from Chuck, raises it to the eight that only she knows, mods by 13, and she gets three. And that was a huge deal because now we can actually agree on a key without having to talk, without having to have the generals all come home. Chuck and Sarah can do this from, from as far apart as they want. Right? We call this key establishment. Uh, they've done this through what's called key agreement, and they've got this k equals 3. The, here's the really nice feature of this. Eve, even if she knows g and n, because remember those were public values, even if she sees the 6 and the 9, because I didn't say anything about the fact those aren't hidden, they're fine, she still can't calculate k. Now with my numbers you could, but get these big enough and it makes it pretty hard. Okay? So she, it's difficult to do that because of, of what in, in cryptography you, 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 use, you lean on these things called one-way functions or hard problems. This one depends upon the fact that discrete logarithms, if you've got a, a finite field with, an, uh, with a prime order and that order is large enough, then finding the discrete logarithms in that finite field is extremely difficult. That's what's happening here, whether you know the math or not. And Diffie-Hellman problem is actually slightly different than that, but it's linked to the discrete logarithm problem. So that's, that's kind of what we'll just say. It's, it's difficult to find k. The problem with this, though, is it's called an un unauthenticated key agreement, or also sometimes called an anonymous key agreement, in the fact that, notice that Sarah got a 6. All she can do is say, I guess Chuck sent this. Chuck gets a 9. He goes, I guess Sarah sent this. There's no authentication. We'll talk a little more about that in a moment. 
Two years later, now these guys, there were three of them, they screwed up, right? Ravest, uh, uh, Shamir, and uh, Adelman, they, they only get RSA. They don't get, nobody ever says their name. In fact, I have to re keep reminding myself if the, what the A actually is. But, you know, none, nonetheless, with this, the math's going to be a little harder. Just squint and let that go by unless you have a math background. But the, we're, gonna, we're actually using real numbers here because I, like, I think it's, it's instructive to see them to, to get a feel for what's happening when I'm doing something that we all talk about. Anna talked about in her, in her, in her talk, this public key, private key exchange. So Sarah creates a key pair by choosing two prime numbers that are close to the same size. There's going to be a lot of this that, again, it's simplified, and I'm brushing over things. Tough luck. That's just, we're, we're making this as simple as I possibly can and still get something. So she chooses two random num I mean, two prime numbers, multiplies them together, and gets 55. And then she finds something called the older totient function of that, which really tells you how many, num how many integers less than 55 are, are um, uh, relatively prime to 55 itself. Why does that matter? Go read a book. Right? It does. Right? So anyway, we've got the quotient function. It turns out that for prime numbers, it's very simple to calculate. It's just 1 minus each of the primes multiplied together, so I get 40. So I can find the quotient function for this, for this 55. Because I know five, P and Q, I can find it really easily. Now, Sarah says, OK, I'm going to choose a value E, 17. It's got to be less than the quotient function 40, and it's got to be relatively prime to 40. Again. Go read a book, but she does it. She takes 17, and she and she solves this equation: e times d modded by the quotient function equals one. She goes and she's got some algorithms that help her solve that. And the key fact of this is that problem is extremely hard unless you know p and q. If you know p and q, it's not hard. If you don't know p and q, good luck. Right? It's basically your, it's basically the discrete logarithm problem. But she does know P and Q. She, she picked the damn things. So she gets D is equal to 33. She stops with all of her, uh, whoops. She stops and says, OK, I'm done here now. I've got a public key. I, I take my E and the N, and I pair those together, call it 1755, and say, this I declares my public key. The D, which I calculated at 3355, it declares my private key. And that is a key pair. Why would you do this? I mean, good God, there's a lot more math there than I'm even pretending to. to, to because of this very stunning fact. Any k less than 55 raised to the e and then raise that to the d and mod by 55 gives me k back. That's, again, we would not have the modern web without that statement right there because that is the reason why public key Encryption works, not to be confused with public key cryptography, but encryption. Okay, so raising by the E is typically called encryption. Raising by the D is typically called decryption. The E and the D could have been switched above. There's a reason why you tend to keep the E one way and the D the other is because you can make the math easier, and so the public key tends to be easier to calculate. Right? If you do it the other way, uh, that's signature. You encrypt with the D, decrypt with the E. We typically call that. We sign with the D, and we verify with the E. But the, it's completely interchangeable. This scheme's great, but it's computationally really slow. About a thousand times slower than Diffie Helm, than uh, pardon me, than symmetric key encryption. So we tend not to use it for bulk encryption, but we do use it for key establishment and digital signatures. Okay. So let's see this in action. Chuck's, I mean, Sarah, all we've done is talk about Sarah getting her number. She's got her number. She's feeling good. Chuck says, hey, give me your private, I mean, your public key. She sends 1755. Chuck grabs a six, says, I'm going to make, I'm just going to use six. And he raises six to her, her uh, public key, 17, mods it by 55, sends that 41 over to her. She takes the 41, raises it to the, pr the private key, 33, mods that by 55, and gets the six back. Now they... I put the nonce in there just because there's got to be some, that, that way they can, they can guarantee that they, that they have the same value. Um, it's just some data that they, they're signing in effect. Um, so this scheme, Chuck and Sarah establish K 
equals 6. This is called a key transport. We don't do this very often. What we tend to do instead is instead of, instead of Chuck selecting 6, they actually do a Diffie-Hellman in the same time as this. That's why if you look in your TSL, TLS stack, you'll see ephemeral, uh, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman RSA because you're doing this, but you're doing a Diffie-Hellman. You're putting those two slides together. The reason you want to do that is because that puts both, both sides have some skin in the game. In this case, Chuck chose the key completely independent of Sarah. So let's look at the structure of this, because this is at the heart of what we're trying to get to. This E17 D33 N55 has a binding relationship through that, that, that little equation that, that, you know, I wave my hands at a little bit. That E times D modded by the totient function of N is equal to 1. That's the binding relationship. And here's the, here's the fact of why we can do this. Because given that E and N, it's very difficult to determine D. Now, if you remember, that's exactly what Sarah did. But she had another piece of information. She knew P and Q. If you don't know P and Q, then basically you need to factor in into the P and the Q so that you can do the calculation. And that's the hard part that's hard. It's called integer factorization. It's, a hard, it's another one of the the hard problems that we use in cryptography for one-way functions. Part of the more structure of this is that Chuck trusts that that in E and N belongs to Sarah. He either does that explicitly, just says, send it on, I'm, I'm ready, bring it. Or he uses, he says, I don't know Sarah, so I'm going to trust Trent. I know Trent, Trent knows Sarah, so I'll transfer that trust to Trent. And you've all done it if you've ever used a CA. The, the certificate authorities are Trent, and you're saying, I don't know. You tell, you tell me. Right? Sarah also trusts that she wants to talk to Chuck. This is what, what I'm going to uh, refer to as an open system. It's got multiple entity trust model, and there's no single person controlling this. And I want to get back to my theme here. There's nothing open about this system. This worked and, and is key to, the, to web development, the web world, because basically Sarah in the web world is an all-comer. She says, hey, bring it on. I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to all kinds of Chucks. Here, I want this iPhone, I mean iPad, talking to there, and that's the only two people I want to talk to each other. This is, this is a closed system. Man in the min middle, I'll just, I'm gonna fly through this because I think I'm gonna run out of time if I don't. Mallory, what, what Sarah did, Mallory can do just as easily. She, she can come up with her own PQ, E, D, and N. Then when Chuck says, give me the key, Mallory intercepts it, gets Sarah's public key, sends her public key to Chuck. Chuck happily uses it, gets 76 this time. Mallory grabs the 76, decrypts it, encrypts it with her key and sends that to Sarah. She, could take, she gets the 41 and she gets six. Notice that they got the same thing. They're still, they're still happy, but here's the real fundamental problem here. Chuck and Sarah can't know this happened. There's no fingerprint in anything that just happened there that Chuck and Sarah can see that, that, that Mallory was sitting in between them. And in, in the scheme, again, this is a simplified scheme. Mallory knows the value of Chuck and Sarah's secret, and that's effectively what I did here. I did it through a means that uh, two different means. On here, this is a jailbroken iPad, and I installed something called SS an SSL kill switch. So when this contacted that guy, and this guy sent back his public key, this guy will accept any public key whatsoever. So it went through, it actually went through my computer where, where my man in the middle is. It gave it a different public key. This guy didn't care. Okay. Now, I wouldn't do this for me, I, I, it makes me insecure, but I would do it because what does this mean? I can see the API now. I can futz with this thing, right? I just took, a, I, I just took this closed system and, and opened the box and I can look inside. And then I went over to curl, put a TAC K on it, and was able to control the light, completely independent of this iPad. Okay, because the TAC K does basically the same thing as the SSL kill switch. It says I don't care. So, this won't, surely this would never happen, right? So, well, let's see. <laughs> this, is a, this is a quote from a document that was uh, obtained by Wikilinks through the shadow brokers. I think most of us heard about this through what the, that the NSA 
uh, hacking tools. This was a document that was in that dump of the NSA hacking tools. And it was a document on, on the Network Operations Division cryptogra cryptographic requirements, and I'm going to read it, and then we'll go back and look at some of the points. Any transport layer encryption must be layered over the encryption discussed in this document because this outer layer may be decrypted by an attacker. Any transport encryption must therefore be used only for traffic blending and ouch, not for secrecy. Right? HT, they're, 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 what they said right there is HTTPS should not be used for secrecy in this fashion that I've just done. It, it, it's going to have to do more. You don't get to just slap an S on there. Okay? So, a couple of things here. Transport layer encryption, that's TLS, that's the S in, in HTTPS. The cryptography discussed in this document was application level uh, encryption. Um, and the traffic blending is the idea that if you, know, if you look at HTTPS traffic, it all looks the same. You can't tell where the route is. You can't tell any headers. That's, they, they're saying, hey, you can use it for that. You just can't use it for secrecy. So, what do we do? Well, there, there are lots of options, none of them easy, but here's one. I've, I've built a framework that I call SRPC. I'm going to discuss it a little bit. I'm not going to show the framework in depth. I'm just going to show the idea of how it compares to RSA and why it gets us to a better situation for this problem. Okay. So, whoops. Same game. I connect to this guy. He comes up. SRPC. His he's also got a secret password. And I can now play with this light. Everything's fine. Well let's see what let's see what uh, our man in the middle saw. Not crap. I mean just it's all encrypted, right? There's nothing there to grab a hold of. In fact, it's even, all, it's even got uh, um, uh, traffic blending mixed in there as well. It's all the same thing. This is over HTTP, by the way. I could be doing this over HTTPS, but in this case, I didn't need to. I've got total encryption over HTTPS in a fashion that in this manner was better than my simple quick solution of just slapping an S after the HTTP and thinking I was done. If I were to try to operate this light from curl, by the way, these, the, uh, all I'm doing here is there, these are some package curl commands. But if I try to do that, it'll just, it'll go out and, whoops, come on, and says bad request. That's, that's all it'll ever do because I'm not authenticated. So let's look at a little bit of what, what's actually going on. Now I'm going to look at basically a, a, a structure that is very similar to the RSA and Diffie-Hellman, but it's called SRP for the Secure Remote Password Protocol. It was invented by Thomas Wu in 1997. And, um, well, let's look at it real quick. It should feel the same. We're doing a lot of the same kind of things we did with both with Diffie-Hellman and with uh, RSA. Chuck and Sarah agree on some, pri uh, some public parameters, 2 and 13. Chuck chooses, now notice Chuck this time chooses, not Sarah. Chuck chooses five and he calculates this, this value called V, which is known as a verifier, by taking two raised to his five, modding by 13, and he gets six. Chuck keeps the, the five and he gives the six to Sarah. And then the protocol follows this way. Chuck picks a random value, 11. He takes that 11 and he says G to the 11, mod 13, that gives me seven. I send the seven across. Now notice I also sent the ID because this is an authenticated key exchange, not an unauthenticated, whereas with Diffie Helmet, so I have to send the ID to say, hey Sarah, I'm Chuck, right? Send the seven over. Sarah takes, that seven, takes the ID and goes and gets Chuck's verifier, and she computes the, her, uh, pardon me, the, the, she grabs a random number B, raises it to, a, the, takes two to that power mod 13, and she adds in Chuck's verifier, and that's what she sends back. Again, why? Because this nice little fact. This is an asymmetric calculation. Notice they're doing two different calculations, but it turns out they're really doing the same thing. Chuck, Chuck does this calculation of B minus G to the X, A, A plus X mod N, he gets three. 
Sarah does her calculation, A times the, the, a, the a she got from Chuck. I notice here the B, the, the B over here was the value gotten from Sarah. Now the A is from Chuck, takes that, raises it, blah, blah, gets three. And that's the magic. Okay? They both now have, have agreed upon key. And, the very, and so this is very similar to a combination of Diffie-Hellman and, and uh, RSA in the sense that you have authentication and you have this key exchange. I'm going to skip over that. Chuck and Sarah established this key via key agreement. Look at the structure. Got a very similar structure. I've got these values, and they're bound together by some mathematical relationship. Given four, three of the values of that mathematical relationship, it's very difficult to, to do the third, to get the fourth one. It's similar to the same thing that, that uh, we had with uh, Diffie-Hellman and, and with RSA. This is actually called the SRP problem. It's linked to Diffie-Hellman, which I already showed was linked to uh, discrete logarithm. In this scheme, Chuck and Sarah only, ch ch only trust each other because they each hold a part of the binding relationship. That's the biggest difference between this and th than just cookie cutter RSA. In cookie cutter RSA, Sarah owned all the binding. She owned every bit of it. She had to pass some of it over to Chuck in the process of the protocol. Okay. Here, this is completely different in now that they, since they both share a piece of that binding relationship, they actually get mutual authentication. This is a really nice type of scheme when I have a closed system. I can, I can have on this now, I can say, Chuck, here's your pass, I mean, here's your uh, yeah, password, and Sarah, here's the verify for that. That X equals five is called the password. Um, and, and now I can actually get, do a mutually authenticated um, uh, key exchange. So here's some of the advantages of using something like SRP and application level security. We got mutual client server authentication. In HTTPS, you do not get mutual authentication. You get one way almost, you, you either get one way or you get one way twice. Typically, you only do one way because typically Chuck only needs to know who Sarah is because Sarah's the all comer. She's the bank. She doesn't care who Chuck is. She just wants, she wants people to come, to come to her website. This is different. These guys, I only wanted them to talk to each other. So the mutual client server authentication ensures that both of these two are only talking to each other. Then I also have a mutual uh, user authentication. That was the password that was passed back and forth between the two. This ensures that the application is, ha is actually acting on behalf of a specific user. And now notice that I'm carefully distinguishing between those. HTTPS tends to do half of the top one and no does nothing on the bottom one. That's, that's purely applications. We all do that in different ways. But HTTPS has nothing to do with that. This authentication is using what's known as a zero knowledge proof. Now this is pretty cool. I'm not going to do it justice. I'm not going to try to describe it too, too terribly in depth. But the basic idea is this. Chuck, if you remember, Chuck got five. And he calculated V, and that's what he gave to Sarah. He did not give her the five. The five is his personal private password secret. He didn't give it to Sarah, and she never knows it. And look at almost all authentication schemes that you've done with HTTPS. What did you do with the password? You sent it right across the wire to the, to the server, okay? And hopes that the server treated it nicely, okay? That's all I got to say there. There's two problems there. One is that anybody who can see the pipe can see the password and anybody on the other end gets the password. Hopefully they treat it nicely. But this zero knowledge proof, the password never leaves the client. Authentication and encryption are in the same layer. This is uh, in, in, in juxtaposition to HTTPS, which is, it has something called the channel, channel binding problem in that the encryption's happening at the transport layer and the authentication of the user's happening at the application level. And those, those two things, you, you really, there, there's schemes to try to bind those together. In this scheme, they were the same thing. They were, they were automatically bound together. Single entity trust model, okay? I wrote the library on here. I wrote the library on here, and I don't care who Kim young L has, he doesn't get to see it, right? It's only me. I'm, I'm the only person who knows about it. Another thing that's kind of nice about this is that it'll change a little bit of the way you think, is that I'm not gonna, uh, I didn't show any of this, but there's, the security is completely orthogonal to the API. The API I used here was a very simple JSON R RPC type thing. It could just as easily have been REST, it could have just as easily been GraphQL. 
I didn't care, right? But the, the key is that the, the security, I get all of this security, and I never had an authentication token in that, that package. I never had any type of security tokens in any of my API, because if you think about it, that's, they really shouldn't have to be there. We, we live with it because we, we think we have to, but wouldn't it be nice if you, 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 when you built your API, you did not think in terms of how do I put, what tokens do I need to be passing and taking care of and checking, et cetera. That's SRP in general. My solution that I've got here running, by the way, that means that this is a framework in iOS here, and it's a, uh, um, uh, an Elixir with, or it's actually got some Erlang uh, libraries as well running on here. Uh, I also, it's, it's an ephemeral key with flexible session management, make it very easy to flush the keys, rekey, auto reconnect on, on stale. Another little minor one, but yet here it is. In this scheme, the client stretching happens on the client, oh, pardon me, the key stretching happens on the client. And if you think about it, that, that, that means you get to leverage that onto, onto thousands of clients instead of having a server that has to do all the key stretching. Because as soon as you do that, is everybody familiar? Well, let me just quickly say, key stretching, the best way to think of key stretching is just a slow hash. It's simply there to make it to where somebody who tries to do a, a, a dictionary rainbow attack on a, on a set of passwords uh, or that, they, they might have, uh, that they might have gleaned um, has a hard time doing that because they, every time they do the hash, it takes them four, or say, 50 milliseconds or more. Say it takes them half a second, right? It slows them down. So here I can do that, all that calculation on here rather than offloading it to the server. Traffic blending, I showed. Replay protection, I don't care, normalization. So here's the cost that I had on the, on the Elixir side. <coughs> Basically that, that, that one thing there. I, I put one middleware in there at the top. What it does is as the request comes in, or pardon me, this, yeah, this is, re, as the request comes in, it unpacks it, hands it to the next layer. The next three layers uh, of this are exactly the same as they were in the other two. It, they do their thing, it percolates back up as it's going back out the door, this uh, SRP CLE handler uh, encrypts it. There's one other little thing there, but that was just some bookkeeping I needed. So, great, this is SRPC, what else could I do? Well, there's lots of, P, uh, password this is this is basically is a password authenticated key exchange. It's it's there's lots of those out there. You could you could look at other ones. There's SRP's one. There's a slew of others. Another thing you could do is you could look back at that structure and you could say, well, if part of the problem was that Sarah had all the knowledge and Chuck had none, why don't I just put the public key on on Chuck and go from there? You could certainly do that, right? That's that's certainly you can do that with something called the Needle Shorter Station to Station and a slew of others, again, that if you go to cryptography and really start to get into security, you will not die of, of starvation, you will die of indigestion. There's lots of it out there, okay? Lots of options. So you can do that. The, the reason I prefer this is that I bind it, that, that it makes key management connected to a, pa a user's password, whereas if you, do, if you did it this way I'm uh, reflecting here, your key management is that you're having to generate RSA keys. Okay. There's also a slew of other things that don't fall into either of these two categories. Again, it's indigestion, not starvation. This is the demo that I've got here. I made it available so if, if anybody wants to look at the code, that's fine. But I actually have another demo that, that's Elixir only. The, the problem with this demo is you've got to have a jail, jailbroken iPad, and you have to know Xcode, and you have to know iOS, and who in here wants to be doing that, right? Nobody. So, so the other one is pure elixir, the, the one on top, All right? Thank you.